Good morning, friends. One of the things that frequently happens when we talk about the incredible grace of God, as we did this past Sunday, is that we start thinking that since God is so gracious, then why don't we just go ahead and enjoy ourselves in our favorite sins, doing so in the knowledge that God will forgive us when all is said and done anyway, right? Because that was a huge part of the encouragement from Sunday's message. God knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. He knows our weakness, our inherent sinfulness. And yet he chose us. He redeemed us. He saved us anyway. So let's give thanks to God for his incredible graciousness. And let's put that graciousness to as much use as possible by sinning even more. Which just shows how gracious God is because he does forgive us, right? Should that be a application that comes out of all that? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> and the Apostle Paul deals with this very same thought in Romans 6, where he writes, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, clearly, Paul is responding to the very same, situa same situation that we presented, right? Uh, why else would he then ask the question, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Because that's the idea that people were putting forward even back then. They heard the gospel of grace that Paul was preaching. And they thought, wow, God's grace. Well, that's, his grace is so great. And in his forgiveness, in that graciousness, God is glorified. So let's accept the gospel of grace. And then let's sin even more so that God's grace abounds even more. And then he receives even more glory for his graciousness. But Paul's response to that whole idea is vehement. By no means, he says, or another translation, may it never be. He is adamant that we should not go on sinning without restraint simply because God is gracious. But here's the part I really want us to see today. Because does Paul say that we should not go on sinning because that would prove we aren't really saved? No, he doesn't. Now, depending on the case, if a person does continue to sin, even after claiming to be a Christian, claiming to come to faith in Christ, if they do continue to sin in a completely unrepentant type of way, they're, they're experiencing zero conviction of their sin and you know no godly sorrow whatsoever, well then that probably indicates they're not a believer to begin with. But I'm not really talking about that right now. What I want to stress is that Paul's point isn't don't keep sinning even though God is gracious because if you do keep sinning in any way, then you're probably not a believer. Because the truth is that all Christians do continue to sin, right? We do struggle with sin in an ongoing fashion even as believers. Paul admits that about himself in just as vehement a fashion in Romans chapter 7. So instead of saying don't sin anymore because that might prove you're not a believer, Paul says, in essence, this is my paraphrase, don't sin anymore because that ongoing sin, that kind of intentional sin, is no longer in keeping with your new nature. When Paul writes, how can we who die to sin still live in it, and everything that follows that, he's, he's essentially saying, don't you understand that in Christ you have changed? That God has given you a new nature, a new identity? And that ongoing sin, that's what belonged to your old nature, your old identity. And so the issue isn't, oh, you, you know, you'll maybe lose your salvation if you keep on sinning. No, the issue is, why would you keep on sinning? Especially in such a purposeful, intentional manner. Why would you sin like that when you have a new nature? Don't keep living according to the old nature. Embrace the new don't continue living according to the flesh, rather live in keeping with the Spirit of God who dwells within you. This is why Paul says, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory uh, of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Embrace the newness of life we have in Christ through the Spirit, rather than continuing to live in the old manner that belonged to our spiritually dead state. And that's really as simple as it is. It's gloriously simple. Paul's response isn't about a threat saying, hey now, watch yourself. If you choose to sin, I'm going to start telling you that you aren't even saved. No, to the contrary, he's saying, hey, do you realize that if you do
to sin, that you're not living in keeping with your new nature. You're living in keeping with your old nature. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't we fully embrace the life that we have in Christ, hungry and thirsting for his righteousness, rather than sinking back into the pigsty of our old sin, which is what our old nature wants? And of course, there is that battle between the old nature and the new. Paul, again, talks about his own struggle in the closing half of Romans 7, and he admits that there's a very real sense in which there are times when he doesn't always win that battle. Even the Apostle Paul falls into sin, or fell into sin, when he knew he shouldn't. But this knowledge is part of the struggle, part of what helps us to overcome in that struggle. And again, it's not based on threats. Quote, unquote, being good as a Christian shouldn't be based on the fear of losing your salvation or on experiencing the wrath of God. Because by the grace of God and according to his promise, we know that we will never experience either of those things. Rather, quote, unquote, being good as a Christian is entirely based on the desire to fully embrace our new nature, our new identity in Christ, to behave in a way that makes sense to behave as a child of God rather than as a servant of Satan. Because when that radical change happens, when we go from essentially the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God, the household of Satan to the household of God, even though we're tempted to still act like a servant of Satan, it makes no sense to act like a servant of Satan. Why should we act like we're still in chains when we have, in fact, been set free? So I hope this offers a helpful perspective on the matter of our sin and God's grace, even as Christians, because we continue to have sin. And yes, God continues to be gracious to us. And if we genuinely belong to Christ, then yes, God absolutely will continue to forgive us our sins. In fact, he's already done that in the personal work of Jesus Christ. But that is our sins past, present, and future. But that doesn't mean we should give in to the temptation to just sin willy-nilly then in the knowledge that we can get away with it because of God's grace. Instead, we recognize that if we focus on our new nature, the nature that actually experiences life, abundant life, well, if that's our focus, the practice of sin just does not make sense. There's no way that the ongoing intentional act of sinning can go hand in hand with the abundant life we have in that new nature. It's trying to force the two natures to mix and it just won't work. We can't have the peace and the life, abundant life of the new nature nature whilst holding on to the sinful pleasures of the old. Therefore, we should forsake the old nature and embrace the new nature fully, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in the knowledge that he will give us everything else we need for life and happiness and satisfaction and peace and confidence in him. With that, I pray you have a good and godly day. And Lord willing, I'll see you soon.